Hi everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the Nordic Football Podcast. I'm Steve Wiss. Um, we will be doing our end of season uh, reviews for both Norway and Sweden uh, coming up next week. But on this particular edition we've got a Danish special. Our man Henry um, has a great in-depth interview with FC Mitchelland winger Ewa Mabil. So... Uh, plenty to look forward to next week, but uh, this is a, a really great interview with the Australian international. So uh, I'll let Henry take it away from here. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a player who's won awards on and off the pitch, uh, a Superliga and Danish Cup champion, FC Michelin and Australia winger, Ewa Mabil. Ewa, thank you so much for, for making the time to speak. Hey man, yeah, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and yeah, really looking forward. Great. We're, we're obviously now in the Superliga's winter break until February next year. How, how are you doing and sort of what are your plans for the, the coming weeks and months? Yeah, right now, obviously, yeah, Superliga finished last week and um, I think we've had great uh, first half of the season and uh, we have a good team this year. So I think now mentally it's just to to, you know, uh, get a break and then come back stronger to finish up the season. So basically, I think that's that's our man- mentality now. Of course, we have Europe games to play and then uh, one more cup game. But um, yeah, I think our minds are, are also set on Superliga as well as other tournaments. But um, yeah, obviously now everything is coming to an end. So we have one more week before we go on our holidays. Great. And what, what are you going to do with your holiday? Uh, I would love to go to Australia, but right now I can't due to um, oh, yeah. the yeah the rules there uh, mm. regarding Corona. So um, I think I'll spend it here in Europe. Uh, maybe go to Spain. Um, I'll go to Greece somewhere to to <laughs> to see some sun. You know what I mean? So <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's certainly, in, certainly in this part of the world, um, it's it's getting dark before like four p.m. now, and it's just yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> some it's, sunshine it's, would it's, be lovely. It's, it's crazy, man. Like, you know, I drive to training in the morning, the sun is not there. And then the period where the sun is there, you know, I'm having lunch inside. And then by the time I get out of the club, it's, it's, it's pretty much dark already. But oh, man. yeah. So, so in, that, in that time that, that, that you're on holiday, are you, are you doing any training or is it literally just recharging the batteries and, and, um, and sort of uh, giving your body a rest? Uh, it's about finding the balance. Obviously, you don't want to <laughs> relax too much. Um, or else you lose your fitness. So, like, you know, usually how I do my stuff is I'll take one week off just to not do anything and just rest my body and mind. Yeah. And then uh, the next two weeks I spend, you know, gradually just building up again. And then by the time we start, I sort of have a little bit of fitness and then um, start to build properly when we together was, as a team. Great. Fantastic. Um, I, I mean, going back to the start of your Super League story, how did the move to Denmark come about? Um, obviously, you know, Michelin is a, is a, is a big club with uh, the big on data. Um, and obviously, I played in Australia, which is far away from here. And, and you know, uh, my agent called me one day and said, oh, Michelin is looking at you. Um, it, it really came very quick. Um, so they, they've Pretty much, they've gathered all my information and compared it to many, many people around my age, uh, around the world. And they obviously went for me and, and I was 19 when I first came here. So that's basically how, how they scouted me uh, through the scouting system of um, collecting data and then comparing. And, um, and yeah, I was grateful to, to come and, and they made it happen quite fast. Um, so... I was really grateful that they were really interested and the deal was done pretty quick. Wow. And d- d- did you ever discover like what was the, what were the key metrics they were sort of looking at that, um, that, that put them onto your profile? Um, to be honest, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, but I guess they were looking at my speed and my skill on the ball and also my output uh, to decide mm. games, to make assists and make goals. Uh, I guess they were looking at that. And I'm sure at that time also they were not looking at my defending skills uh, because I was <laughs> I was pretty bad as a also defensive winger and 
which in these days you have to be as complete as you can. Yeah. Um, and that's the next stage of my game that I developed here in Denmark was, um, you know, not the so offensive part, but more the, you know, collective uh, when we don't have the ball, you know, mm. kind of, uh, yeah, that's what I had to develop when I came here. Um, that's really yeah. interesting. I was, uh, yeah, because I was going to ask you, what were the sort of the the main differences you noticed, you know, playing in in and training in Denmark, you know, mm. from um, from Australia. Like, what what were the what were the main things that were that were different? Uh, obviously, yeah, there's relegation. That was the biggest thing. Um, so people are pretty much European football is is it's a survival kind of uh, mood that you're in all the time. You know what mm. I mean? So if you're not playing good football, not getting the results. Uh, the the penalty at the end of the season will be you get relegated. Um, and in, in Australia, there's no relegation because the league is quite young. But there's more risk there, risk taken um, in Australia because, you know, if you're having a bad year this year um, as a club, you know next year you're not going to go down. So you can you can sort of prepare uh, for, for what's to come uh, next year. But here is it's, it's like if you have one bad season, you know, can cost you another two or three years before you come back into the top league. Um, mm. So basically the mentality was different. I think uh, the way they approach things uh, was a big difference. Uh, that's what I found here in Europe. Is, is, that, um, is that sort of lack of uh, <clears throat> relegation and the, the ability to be a bit more... Um... A bit more daring is that reflected in in the playing style like did, did you feel as a player more freedom there than you did than you did in denmark uh i didn't want to lose uh who i am as a player i sort of just had to adapt to some things and then uh see how i can implement them into continuing to develop because to be honest i think i've played my best football in adelaide uh in a sense of um <clears throat> we had a spanish coach who was really football based and um, he wanted me to express myself, and um, and I'm that kind of player who loves to express myself and and you mm. know uh, make the fans enjoy the game because people pay to come watch us play, so we have to put on a show for them as well as win games for the fans, you know. Um, so I had to find that balance in Adelaide. I didn't really have that worry in a sense uh, when I was in Australia. I didn't have the worry of you know having to worry about relegation, about this or that, uh, but. I was in such a great environment also that I developed as a, as a footballer um, during, during my time there. And that's what prepared me to come here. And when I came here, I had to also adapt to this kind of environment and then see how I can go forward, uh, not losing myself as a player because I love to dribble. I love to, to do skills on the football field. Yeah. Um, I don't want to lose that because that's how I express myself. Um, but I also had to find the balance of when to do it, when not to do it. Um, so that was the biggest thing. Yeah, and I, I, I think that I think you know, Mitchell and obviously um, have sort of become known for for um, the the assortment of tricky wingers. That mm. they've got. I, I know that Dre obviously moved early in this earlier this season, but you know, all, all of you have that that ability to to take people on and and do something mm. exciting with the ball. And I, th I think that's what makes. Um, makes Michelin quite sort of compelling to watch this season. Yeah, it's, um, you know, you have to be good one against one uh, as a winger or have some kind of creativity to, to, to make the last pass or to, to score a goal. Um, you know, there's nothing more as a winger you enjoy than, you know, having a good dribble and making a good assist or, you know, doing a good dribble and then scoring a goal. Um, mm. So I think that's, that's what we get paid for and that's 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 sort of I think most players who play as a winger are the ones that bring excitement to 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 a football field most of the times. Um so that's the job and the risk we have to take and we have to continue to do that or else you know we become very robotic and 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 not really do our job because everybody on the field has their job um and it's important to understand what your job is and do to the best of your abilities. And as a winger, I try to, you know, adapt my game all the time to try to, to become better and better. Fantastic. Um, but one of the things I've noticed on some of the videos that the, um, the various Super League clubs put out from sort of like behind the scenes 
is that English seems to be the language that's sort of like spoken in the dressing room. Um, is this, is, I mean, is that the case? And has that always been the case since, since your time in Denmark? Uh, it's not always been the case. Um, obviously, Denmark is a great country that, you know, teach English at a young age. Um, and it, it makes it easier for, for, you know, for us to integrate or for foreigners to integrate into a team. Mm. Uh, there was a period when I came to Denmark that uh, the, there was a time where one of the coaches wanted to speak English. Uh, no, wanted to speak, uh, sorry, Danish. And um, basically the, the, the motive behind that was to try to get the foreigners also to try to integrate and talk to the Danish guys to ask, okay, what did he say or this or that. Um, but it's also, like I said before, everything is about finding the balance. Mm. And then that didn't last for long because, you know, it didn't, you weren't getting out the clear messages. Um, but since then it's been, it's been English and, and, you know, also I'm, I'm quite an interesting person in the sense of trying to learn other cultures and trying to understand people. Um, so I've, I've been trying to learn Danish, so I'm also open to like, you know, trying to hear new words and things like that. So it just depends uh, to you as a person. If you want to really understand, you can try to learn the language, but it's very easy here to speak English and everybody speaks it. So it's not a big, big problem. Um, in our dressing room is pretty much English, yeah. And of course, you have the locals who speak their language now and then with each other. Yeah, I would say I would say my experience is that there's people people I've come across people in Denmark who speak English probably better than me as a native speaker. <laughs> so it's uh, it's obviously very well taught. Yeah, um, you, I mean you've been in Denmark for was it six years now? Um, yeah, yeah, six years. Yeah. What, what's the most sort of like Danish habit you've picked up in that time? Uh, I try to get into a habit of eating the the Danish bread, but that didn't last very long. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> So I, I dropped that, and um, but I really love Danish culture, and I've sort of Den, Denmark is a big part of me, a big part of my life now because you know I came here as a young boy, and I pretty much grew into a, an adult while I was here, or mm. grew into a man. So Denmark is a big, big part of me. Uh, I can sort of speak the language now, so I understand the Danish humor. Um, we sometimes can be difficult to understand because there's a lot of sarcasm. And if you don't understand the culture, <laughs> then you're not really, you know, find it as funny. But the funniest part was just once I start to understand the language, uh, people who I thought were not that funny became even more funnier because you get to know them on their, on their level of, you know, uh, how they do their thing. So that, that for me, I'm really, really grateful for that, to be honest. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, th that must be one of the great things about being a, a professional footballer that you can, you know, you can have these experiences in, in other countries. And I guess it, if like you, you choose to sort of really engage with the, the culture and sort of make it into a, a, a life experience as well as a professional one, then that must be super rewarding. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, for me, like before I was super strict, I was like, you know, it's just football, football, football. Um and, you know, the older you get, I think when you're open-minded, you start to, to loosen up a bit and not become so tense. And I think, you know, when you're not tense, I think that's, that's when everything just flow, flows. Um, and that's what I've been, and I'm at that stage of my life where, you know, I'm open to, to just learning and enjoying this great experience that I'm having as a footballer and both as a person, uh, which is most important for me. Um, you know, I know football. I'm great at it, and um, and I do my best. I train hard. I I play, I play my heart out when I play. Um, but there's also another. There's a person behind that. So you also have to look at that experience also, and what what you're learning uh, through football is that is teaching you life basically, uh, and the disciplines that you will continue to have for the rest of your your life. I think it's great. It's, it's great that you're so self-aware about that. I mean, I, l l lots of times in life, I think you you sort of experience something, but don't really realize what you're experiencing at the time, and so it doesn't allow allow you to get the most from it. And it mm. sounds so, sounds like you kind of like you un you understand the the position you're in, and you're sort of taking taking the opportunity with with both hands, which is amazing. Mm. Yeah, it's it, it's like you said, it's all about experience and how you. 
how you take that experience and implement it is up to you. And because life is about decisions and then, you know, consequences, whether it's good or bad decision is it's, it's your own experience. So mm. if, if you, if you're taking everything as a lesson, then you can implement and say, okay, this is good. This works. This doesn't work. You know what I mean? And that's, that's sort of what I've been, I've been paying attention to, to things that I can do and things that I can control and, and learning from my experiences and then implementing them. And then also at the same time being aware that, you know, I, there's a lot of kids that look up to me. So I also have to try to, to teach them in a way that they don't make the same mistakes that I did um, so that they can have that shortcut instead of repeating, you know what I mean? So um, that's sort of the responsibility I've, I've accepted and I just continue to grow with that. Brilliant. That's super inspirational. <laughs> um, the, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, about playing in Denmark, just because, you know, it's, a, it's <clears throat> obviously something I'm never going to be able to experience. But um, <laughs> Mitchell and have, you guys have got a new coach this season in Bo Henriksen. How, mm. How's his approach to sort of training and tactics changed from how it was previously under, under Brian Prisk? Um, it's, yeah, like, you know, Mitchell is always progressing. And we've had great coaches uh, over the years. Uh, Brian Prisco was really, really good. Um, you know, and Mitchell and Harvard have, have a habit of developing players and also coaches. So um, every coach has got different tastes or different flavor to add to the team, you know, to sort of spike things up a bit. Um, and Bo is, uh, is, 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 is doing that. So he's adding his style of things, uh, which is the encouragement side. Of uh, you know, you see him on the sideline, you know. Uh, yeah, it's very animated. Yeah, <laughs> so um, he adds that to 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 give players that kind of um, energy. You know what I mean? So it brings that a lot, uh, and and that's very motivating because, you know, sometimes when you lack that little motivation and you see your coach on the sideline screaming, then you know probably just pushes you a little bit more or wants you to, you know, you do a little bit better. Um, mm. So he brings that. Uh, that fighting spirit uh, to us. Yeah, he, he he must burn almost as many calories as you guys during a game. Oh, yeah, 100%, <laughs> man. I think it burns more. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I wanted to ask how, how you feel about VAR. Like, do, from a player's perspective, do you think it has improved the game? It's a difficult question because, like, for me, like football is an emotional game, and like uh, I think VAR is taking that human side of things away from the game. Mm. Um, like a referee making a making a decision, it's not there anymore. Um, and of of course, there's benefits to it. You know, um, you know, if I could pick, I'll say in bigger games you can you can do that. Games where one decision can decide, you know, whether you win the Champions League or not or whether you go to the World Cup or not. You know what I mean? Yeah. Those kind of games, you can have those. Uh, but in every game, it sort of <clears throat> it slows down the game and it also gives doubt to um, to the fans and also the player who has scored, you know. So you sort of don't want to celebrate and let out your emotions um, because you don't know if it's going to be cancelled. So pretty much mm. you can wait another minute for the goal to be confirmed and then... <clears throat> and then you would try to um, you would try to celebrate after that, but it's not the same feeling because is yeah the moment has just the gone. gone yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's why I, I don't like that side of it, but I like the side of it that it can split a game in a sense of big games. Um, you know, can help make the right decisions. Yeah, so yeah, it's sort it's, of like preventing the big injustices but exactly exactly yeah exactly um what well, another thing i wanted to ask you about is that probably more than most international players playing in europe you have to clock up some serious air miles for your like whenever there's an international break yeah how, how does that long travel sort of affect you for the international games and i guess like for the return do you have to do any sort of special preparation yeah, it's, 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 um, we're quite blessed with our, uh, you know, sponsor, sports science in Australia uh, with our national team. I think they're some of the best in the world. So they're always collecting information to, 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 to see how they can improve uh, players such as us who are playing for the national team because we have to travel a lot. 
<clears throat> so we're really grateful for that. There's always feedback and always a, a specific program made for every player uh, to try to help them, you know, get over jet lag easier or quicker um, than you would normally when you're playing in Europe. Yeah, you, it's pretty much the same uh, time zone. So um, we're really grateful for that. We have some of the best in the world at, you know, creating this kind of program for us, uh, the yeah. recovery program, the, you know, um, the getting over jet lag program. So I think it becomes easier and easier the more you do it. Um, and now with information and the technology that they have, it's starting to, you know, become quite, yeah, you, quite normal. You must get through quite a few box sets on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. You must get through quite a lot of box sets on the plane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I think I've watched everything, man. I think I've seen everything. It's it's crazy. It's crazy. But it's also, that's the beauty of also, you know, being able to represent your country. It's the best feeling in the world. And you also get to experience the, the world by traveling, um, which is quite, quite interesting. Uh, obviously, it's hard during these times, but um, it's still it's still a blessing to, to, to travel and play for your country. I bet, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can, you can see, um, uh, I remember seeing your first goal for, for Australia and just like, you, you could see how proud you were to, to score it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the best feeling in the world. It's, it's hard to describe, um, to score for your national team. It's uh, to be <laughs> honest, if I could do it every day, I would love to do that. And that's why every day when I work hard, I know what I'm working hard for, um, to experience that feeling, you know, for the fans to to also see it, my family. So there's a lot on the line um, when I'm playing for the national team, and and that's that's one of my biggest motivations uh, to to uh, to achieve greatness for for my national team one day. That's what I continue to work hard for. Fingers crossed, man. You, yeah. I, I think you I think you'll get there. <laughs> Thank you, bro. <laughs> Hopefully, one day. Um, speaking of goals, your your volley back. I think it was in round four against Vila. That must mm. be up there technique-wise with like the best goals you've scored. But like, which uh, I guess which goal which goal in Denmark has has been the most memorable for you? Um, Denmark. I've scored two or three volleys now. No, two volleys. Uh, I think I scored a similar one against uh, against Aarhus the year we won the the, the goal or the the championship. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was nice, uh, but we didn't win that game, so it didn't feel so nice. Um, but yeah, the one against Violet, to be honest, I think, I think it's one of my favorite. But there's one against Suni Yusuke. Um, I scored. It was my with my right foot, which is my stronger foot. But um, I think it will be out of those three uh, that will be my top. Uh, I can't really pick between them. Yeah, I mean. I guess- that volley against Viola with, with with your wrong foot as well. Oof. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> that was it. I'd... Yeah, I've been practicing that a lot actually. So like, you know, I I've been talking a lot to the players. I talked to Dry a lot. I said, look, when you get the ball here, I'll be running sort of this position, uh, whether I'm playing right or left wing. Uh, so if I'm playing right wing, uh, Sisto normally cuts in, and then we find each other. We do it all the time in training. Mm. So like. When I got that opportunity, it was sort of just like, it's sort of like a deja vu um, uh, because like I do it in training a lot, uh, but there's difference when it comes to a game because game has fans, it has this sort of different pressure. So um, to do it in the game was sort of like, also was, uh, what do you, what's the word? Uh, I was so satisfied uh, yeah, yeah. because like, it's not that often you can get that opportunity in a game. Uh, yeah. And in training, I get it all the time. Sometimes I score two or three in training. Um, but it's hard in a game. In a game, maybe you get one uh, every five or six games. And if you don't take that, and then it's another six games before you can do it again. Um, so I was really, really, um, yeah. <laughs> it was nice. It was nice. Great. Yeah. Um- yeah, you, you mentioned there actually about the fans, and I think it's it's just been so noticeable this season how much more exciting it is, like from from a fan's perspective, to watch games with with fans in the stadium. Like, mm. ha, have have you noticed it um, significantly as a player? And like, is there a particular stadium that you, apart from the the MCH Arena, like a, a particular mm. stadium you enjoy playing at for the atmosphere? 
Uh, I like Bromby. I like to play in Bromby. I like to play in Copenhagen um, because their fans are very passionate and, and they're always there in numbers. Uh, and to be honest, like, uh, of course, our fans are always there. Um, but I really like playing in those stadiums um, in Copenhagen and, and uh, in Parken and in Bromby Stadium. Mm. It's, uh, I think for me, it's one of the best in, uh, in Denmark, two of the best, to be honest. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess when Michelin comes to town as well, it's always going to be a big game between those teams. So you, you get the atmosphere and you get the flares and the choreography and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I remember two years ago, we played in the cup final against Bromby. And that was electric, you know, just the whole city when we were driving to the game, <laughs> you know, the buzz around it. It was just everything. And the fans of the stadium it was it was top. It was one of the most, you know, uh, the best, one of the best experiences I've experienced in Denmark, uh, fans-wise. Yeah, I bet. I mean, it was, one of the things that sort of got me into Danish football in the first place was the just the, the atmosphere is um, mm-hmm. just incredible. And like, it, it really, it really does make such a huge difference when, you know, the, the, the noise and the sounds and all, mm. all that stuff that happens around the match. Mm. Yeah, I think it's getting better. It was getting better until uh, Corona decided to just stop everything. Yeah. Um, but it's picking up again, which is really nice. Uh, I think Danish football is growing in that sense. And and that's why, like we spoke earlier about, you know, teams like uh, Silkeborg, Vivo, um, they're playing some nice football now. No chilling, of course. Um, they're starting to attract the eyes, you know what I mean? Which is the most important for the fans. I think, like, to watch good football, it's, 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 there's nothing better. You know, sometimes you might not win, sometimes you might win. But when you, when you play good football, enjoyable football, you will attract people to the stadium. Um, you know, uh, and I, I hope more teams like that decide to play football rather than being scared and trying to, you know, uh, play, I don't know, uh, too defensive and then also losing rather than, you know, standing up and say, oh, we're going to play our game. If we lose, OK, but if we don't, yeah. and then that's a bonus. Um, I think that's the kind of mentality some coaches are starting to come with now. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, and I, I mean, as well as attracting sort of viewers and fans, it's mm. also attracting um, like clubs. I mean, if, if you look, look at the transfers that happened this last summer, you know, Suleimana and Modarami, like big, big money moves that the Super League hadn't necessarily seen, like transfers that size before uh, going to big clubs. It's like mm. it's it, it clearly clubs re- realize there's a lot of talent in the league. Yeah, yeah. And that's the beauty about, you know, uh, the Danish league now is starting to, is giving the young young kids uh, the opportunities. You know, Dansko, um, you know, Olsen, all these young players who have yeah. done well. And now they're representing their country, you know. But if they were not given the opportunity, then, you know, they will not be representing the country and, and, and you know, be who they are at the moment. So <clears throat> it's, a, it's a credit to the Super League and the, and the clubs that are giving the young ones a chance uh, to express themselves. And the whole world is taking notice now. So I think Denmark is one of the biggest <laughs> scouted leagues now because for young players. So there's that big opportunity there now because of the hard work of the clubs and also the, the league in general. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was over in Denmark a couple of weeks ago and I went to the Copenhagen Aarhus game and saw the debut of, uh, of Rooney Bardji. Mm. Mm. And yeah, just it, it, amazing to think a player making his you know first team debut age sixteen. Mm. He'd only turned sixteen a couple of days ago, and you know he was probably the best player on the pitch for the first half, certainly. Mm. Um, yeah, that that just. I mean, I watch a lot of Premier League. That just wouldn't really happen in the Premier League. No, no, that's 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 the beauty now. Like you know, you saw him playing against Aarhus, uh, and then the week after, I think he played against Obo. And he scored, so Fantastic like goal. Yeah. you know, amazing. So like, chances like that don't really come. Uh, and and it's a credit to Copenhagen, credit to to for them giving them the, the opportunity, and also you know picking the moment to to also you know prepare him and to 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 play him in the right moment, which is a credit to the coach and the club. Um, and he's taking his opportunity. So like. Sky's the limit, you know, for for young players, and and it's a good it's a good example for young players to look up to, knowing that if they work hard, 
they will get the opportunity. Um, yeah, yeah, yes. the pathway to the first team is there. Exactly, exactly. You, you talked about your one-on-one drills before. Who's the toughest defender you've come up against? In the Superliga? Uh, well, yeah, in the Superliga and, and also internationally. Um, in the Superliga, I don't know. Um, but uh, in the... Uh, internationally, one who played in the Champions League last year, um, I think it was Robertson. Robertson, because he's, he's, he's fast um, mm. and... He's a machine in that sense. So <laughs> normally I'm faster than my, my defenders. Uh, but when you have somebody who's also fast, then it makes it hard because you can you can dribble them and then they will still get up and then try to catch you again. Um, yeah. So that was that was not easy. But um, so I would say internationally is him. Um, and in the Super League, uh, in the Super League, we're very direct. So we really one-on-ones come towards the end of the game and you can't really remember that. Um, so I can't really say anybody in the Superliga at That's this fair. moment. That comes to the top of my head. Um, yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the off-the-pitch stuff. So obviously, uh, big respect to you for everything you've done with the, the Barefoot to Boots initiative. Um, mm. And I, I wondered, like, for, for anyone listening to this who's not familiar, can you just talk a little bit about how it came about and, and sort of what you're doing with it on an ongoing basis? Yeah, so basically, um, I was born in a refugee camp uh, in Kakuma, uh, Kenya. And my parents are from Sudan, obviously. Uh, and yeah, I left the camp when I was 10, uh, 2006, and then went to Australia. And then when I was in Australia, I basically, I worked hard to become a professional football player. And then one time I got holidays and then I wanted to just go back when I was 18 just to visit and and and, and I took a couple of suitcases, you know, uh, full of uh, training clothes, game clothes, um, and a couple of boots. And then I, I went there and then handed them out to the kids and then I slowly started to realize that the kids were playing barefooted, um, pretty much everybody. So, um, and... You know, I have I have a sponsor of Nike. Many have sponsors of Adidas, uh, and you get eight, maybe ten pairs of boots every year from them. So I came up with this idea to say, okay, uh, what if I talk to all my teammates and they could collect their boots at the end of the season, and then I would take them. So basically, that's how the idea came about, and and the idea sort of turned into something bigger. Uh, so we started looking at other areas, education, health. And, you know, we got some incubators to the hospitals. Um, so it was basically every six months I was going there. Um, but now, obviously, because of Corona, it's, it's difficult to do that. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's what Barefoot to Boots is. Um, basically, football is the foundation. And then out of football, you, you expand in other areas to try to help whatever is needed in those camps. Man, that's amazing. Um, yeah, just like I, I, I remember reading about it a couple of years ago and just, yeah, uh, it's, it's such an impressive initiative. And it, I, I guess it's something that um, you, you, you may end up spending more time involved in, you know, post, uh, post playing career. Mm, yeah, yeah. We'll, um, we'll see how, what the future holds. But like, you know, I'm working hard to try to help people um, as much as I can. And hopefully, I can continue to do a lot of that uh, when I finish my football uh, because I think we can all do our job. When we do our job, the world becomes a better place uh, for all of us. Uh, so that's I'm just trying to do what I can. And if it makes a difference in 10 people's lives, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's those 10 people that will go and help another 10 people and then blah, blah, continues. So that's how I look at it. Yeah, it's really, it's really insp- inspirational, man, honestly. Cheers, man. Um, I, I've also seen um, a number of your posts that sort of um, on social media kind of drawing people's attention to the subject of mental health. Um, mm. I think it's brilliant to have someone in your position talking about this. What What do you do to try and sort of keep your mental health in a good way over the course of the year? You know, you've got obviously a very high pressure job, um, lots of travel, like unusual hours. Like, mm. what, yeah, what do, what do you do for yourself? I think it's uh, grounding yourself. And um, basically, there's many ways. Uh, There's meditation. There's reading also that keeps you, you know, keeps your mind calm a little bit. And for me, the biggest thing is nature, just going out in nature and just 
you know, taking a walk, uh, turning off your phone, for example, uh, for 30 minutes and then just going for a walk. It was really calm your mind. And then the, one of the biggest thing is also talking about it, uh, talking to people and asking people. You might be not the one struggling with it, but somebody else is. So you have to check up on your friends and your relatives or even a random person, just making a random person smile. That, that goes a long, long way. Uh, because you know you've just made that person smile, and that that's a part of their day that they, they will probably remember. And I think those kind of things are the simple things that I try to encourage people to do um, as much as they can. Uh, because this world now is, is is easier to be, you know, to be busy because the world is what it is now. Uh, there's entertainment everywhere. So, and then this entertainment makes you forget, you know, what's what's really inside yourself. Um, mm. So I think it's important to, to, to find somebody you can express yourself to and talk about things. And, and it doesn't make you less of a man or less of a woman if you're struggling with something and you admit it. To be honest, being vulnerable, I think, is one of the best things you can do for your soul um, because it makes you, you know, yeah, just let it out and then you can solve it. But if you keep it inside, <laughs> no one's gonna know so people will not really try to help you you know because there's there's a lot of help out there yeah absolutely and it's it's amazing when you do when you do open up to people how many people are maybe going through something similar or can relate to how you're feeling in in, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily have known unless you'd been the one to to tell them first mm. yeah it's 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 crazy man like I think all of us, no matter how perfect you think you are, or how perfect you think another person is, I think all of us go through some some stages. Whether that's that's during a week or during one month, one year, or during your life, you go through some stages where, you know, you need help. So I think it's it's also about being open uh, to your, to yourself and to others. Uh, that's how you you share the problems uh, because if you keep it then you're, you're the one that's just going to bottle it, bottle it, you know. But if you let it out, I think, you know, opens up and, and you know, you half the problem, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, um, problem so shared the, is a problem halved, right? Ex exactly, exactly. That's, that's one of the best sayings for this topic that we're talking about. So, yeah. Great, man. Well, uh, yeah, ho hopefully, um, hopefully there's some comfort out there in, in those words and there's some really good advice from you. Uh, no worries, man. It's, um, I think, I think, yeah, people, people are there to, to socialize and I think we're socialized kind of species, you could say. Um, and sometimes when we don't do that, especially these, these last two years has not been easy for everybody. So mm. I think this, this topic is, it's really, really important right now um, because of the times that we're going through. Yeah, and I, I think I think also for lots of people, myself included, you know, going to going to a football game is your sort of it it, it serves that social pur purpose as, mm. as much as it does an, like an entertainment thing. It's right, you know, it's right. seeing your friends, it's it's spending time outdoors, it's you know, it's doing all those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like going to a football game is. You know, I remember when I was young, I used to try to go to every game. Obviously, I couldn't because financially we didn't have that much money to always go to the games. So, like, you know, when I can, it was, you know, the best time because I can talk with my friends. I can, you know, and then watch a game because, you know, I've always had a dream to play. But when I look at it now, I don't think it was so much the game that was important. It was so much like, you know, seeing a collective of people supporting one thing or supporting a team of the of their liking or their um, their state or their the the team, their local team. I think there's a sense you feel like you're in a group, you know. Yeah. And then yeah. when that when that get and then when that get taken away from you, when you feel like uh, you're part of a group and that get taken away from you, then sort of that's like a big big thing um, for many people. Um, I don't think it's so much the game. The game is is a benefit side to it. Um, but I think the feeling of being in a group, it's what's really, really important. And I don't think people understand that, but, you yeah. know, <laughs> it, I, yeah. It's like a, it's, it's a shared identity, isn't it? It's, you know, um, it, it's like 
a, a, a shared interest, a reflection of where you're from. Like it, it all, all these things are wrapped up in football. It's yeah. Well, that's, mm. what, that's why when people say it's just a game, I think they miss some of these nuances that, that how much other stuff is wrapped up in it. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, like I feel the game we play football is, is, is basically for the fans or for the people, uh, because what that might mean, it, it might mean different things. When it's for the people, it's, it, they are the ones that bring life to it. And when, when people are united as one, like <laughs> at a football game, then that's what they, they're putting their energy towards, you know, 11 players on the field, for example, and giving you that energy, you know. Um, so when the fans were not there for me, it was like, uh, shit, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's just, it's just, it really, there's been good side to, 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 to this, um, this pandemic because, you know, it makes you realize how important being in a group and also being socially with people mm. is, you know, uh, on every level. Absolutely, man. I've, I've, I've definitely felt that for sure. Yeah. Um, it, it sounds, it sounds like you watch, you watch a fair bit of football outside of, uh, outside of your own career. Like, did, how much do you watch and are there any teams that you that you enjoy watching or leagues or or do you just watch what's on um i'm a big fan of united uh man united uh it's my favorite team since yeah since i can remember uh, obviously the, the last <coughs> the last uh, seven years has not been the best because yeah um been up and down so i've sort of not really followed them as much but you know now it's, it's also my job uh, to play football. So I also also pay attention to the other team to analyze them, you know, to try to, you know, improve my game. Or if we're playing a team in one week, I try to watch them to see how they play mm. and how I c we can take advantage of that. Um, so, yeah, I do see a lot of football based on that, not, not based on, um, you know, my team is united. I love the Premier League. I love the Liga. I love Bundesliga. You know, so when I can, I see some of those games. But usually, I'm playing at the same time as most of the games. So really, you don't get that time. Uh, but when you're at home, it's it's nice to put it on and just sort of relax. Yeah, yeah. for sure, man. Yeah. Um, I, I I had a few quick fire questions about your your teammates at, at Midland. Mm -hmm. Who who's got who's got the best fashion sense? Uh, who, uh, uh, there's different. There's two different. So if it's um, if it's street, or if it's like the hip hop kind of dressing, mm. I think it's Ivanda or me. And then <laughs> if it's uh, the classic old um, uh, classic, just pretty much classic. And then it's Eric, our captain. He's he, he loves to wear a suit. You know, one time we had a bet. I said because I see him wearing suit all the time. So I said you wouldn't do it for one week, and it was the best week of his life. He was just wearing it every day of the week just to prove the point. So he ended up winning that. Um, but yeah, he, he loves the classic. Um, you know, the club suits. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. And who, who's who's the sort of the biggest joker in the squad? Uh, Pion is a good. Is a, is a, he loves a banter. Um, who else? Yeah, Pion loves a banter, and <laughs> and also Crive. Crive is uh, one of my buddies. Uh, he's he love he loves a good laugh. Um, and good old Tim Spa. I don't know if you remember Tim Spa. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He he's 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 funny in an awkward way. So <laughs> you could you could put that on, and then I'll. I'll I'll send him the audio of me saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and who would you say has got the worst taste in music? Worst taste of music? Four. There's a lot. <laughs> so I'm the DJ in the changing room mostly uh, okay. on everyday life. Uh, but then on game days, it's Eric. Um, with the worst taste of music. Because sometimes we will rotate, we'll say, okay, you can take it today. But usually it will last five minutes when somebody else takes it. And then... The the usual DJ is back, but um, <laughs> whew, uh, maybe Gustav is Saxon. <laughs> he plays some some funny songs, and everybody was like, "Yeah, nah." <laughs> so, uh, how did you become the official DJ? You just got the best musical taste. 
Yeah, I think I got the vibe. I got like, um, I mix it up. So pretty much I, because I'm good at understanding people and what they like and what they don't like. So I sort of try to feel the music uh, and try to implement on what the group would like also. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of how I think. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but maybe they think I'm a shit DJ and they just don't want to say it. <laughs> maybe they're just being nice. So uh, right. I really don't know. Yeah. So you got the aux cable on the on the coach then? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I'm conscious that I'm conscious that you you giving up your evening to talk here. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll wrap it up shortly. But I just wanted to ask a little bit about the the future. Um, mm. what uh, sort of do you see yourself staying in Denmark? For like the foreseeable future would you like to test yourself in another league i, I know it's probably um you, it's probably quite hard to predict but um mm. how do you sort of see the future playing out yeah obviously it's, a, it's an interesting question because like you know i've been in michelin for long now and i've achieved everything i think i've said it before uh we've qualified for champions league uh, we've won the cup we won the league so like sort of i've experienced everything um in many levels and you know i had the opportunity to resign my contract um i think almost a year ago um but i've sort of made that conscious decision that you know i want to try something new um so obviously that's that's also why i've not been playing uh recently or as much as i would like uh because you know i want to i want to uh, one day or soon make a change to to try something different in order to try to accomplish new goals. Um, so I really hope I can, my dream is to play in the Premier League, La Liga or Bundesliga. So I need to take that next step to, in order to get to that, uh, those, those dreams, I need to, yeah, to try to find a way to, to lead me to that path. So basically that's where my, my heart and my mind is at, is to try to push myself really, um, and if I do stay in Denmark, and then so be it. But um, I'm trying my best to to also take that next step and challenge myself because I know I know the league now. I know how how everything works, and you know it's about setting setting new goals really for me now. Yeah, and I mean everything you've everything you've uh, you've sort of put your mind to, you've accomplished so far. So. Uh... I've yeah, so faith. far. I've got so every far. faith we're going to see you in the Premier League, man. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, but, you know, uh, when there's a new level, you have to also change some things uh, in order to, to go up to that new level. So that's what I'm trying to uh, find ways. What do I need to do to, to get to those levels uh, or to accomplish those dreams? Um, and I love Michelin so, so much. Like, really, uh, it's hard to explain, but it's been a club that's helped me. Uh, the fans have helped me, you know. Um, so it's not easy for me to like, you know, be in this situation also. Uh, yeah. And also I get a lot of messages from the fans, you know, saying, you know, we love you and, you know, we don't understand what's going on. Why are you not playing? Why this or why that? And it's, it's not easy to explain, you know, when you love something or somebody so much uh, that, you know, sometimes you just have to let, um, I don't know, nature do its cause or the universe do what it has to be, what it has to do. Um, and so that's the situation I had to accept. Um, and I really, really, you know, I'm a big fan of Michelin. So I hope when my time is up here, I, I continue to support them wherever I am. Absolutely, man. And I, I think even, even even if you're not not playing um, a huge amount at the moment, you, you can you can still see and it, it's reflected also in like, I guess, in, even in your numbers this season. But, um, you know, you're, you're, you're still producing every time you go out there, you're still, you know, going at it 110 percent. So mm. I think the fans can see that. Right. That makes a big difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's that's. That's what we have to accept now as players that uh, football, unfortunately, has become business. And, um, and sometimes the feelings of the fans, the feeling of the player doesn't really matter if it doesn't suit the business. Mm. Um, and that for me is a shame because there's people out there who, who purely play for, 
to to give everything for the people who support them to people who who enjoy watching their team you know um but nowadays it's it's like the saying money talks is it's really what's happening in football um and and it's a shame but it, it's just the way it's been moving um so i think it's going to be hard for fans to understand that but sometimes when fans understand that is also just business then they can also i don't want them to understand that to be honest i'll take that back because like then it will change their view on many things mm-hmm. i'd rather them just going out there trying to support the team and being there for the team rather than trying to understand how everything works from yeah. the inside um yeah that makes sense man well whatever the future holds i, mm. I wish you the best of luck for it um you, you know uh, you you've put in you put in the work so i'm 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 sure that i'm sure that you're going to get a positive outcome whichever way it goes yeah no i appreciate it man i appreciate the love because like you know I've, i felt i saw you, you guys content and i just right away follow and just because what you guys are expressing on your social medias is is nice and normally you know Dennis Media will contact me to try to get a word you know for whatever purpose um but I've been really staying away but I I felt connected to to what you guys would would... oh, thank you man that's that's uh I really appreciate that and yeah th- 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 this all started for me just out of um a real sort of passion and enthusiasm for the for the league so um yeah it's 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 brilliant that it connected with you and I'm super grateful um for you giving up the time to to talk today. So, um, yeah, and and that's that's what I felt was a difference because like I seen you going to stadium to stadium trying to follow, you know, the different atmosphere, um atmospheres in in different stadiums and I really like that because it's not normal because some people would just sit at home and then just assume stuff. Um and then when you get out there to actually try to understand then that that's that's a different way, you know, to to it because it brings that experience and then you get your feedback and then you you give it to whoever's reading it or listening to it i think that's that's different and that's that for me was probably one of the reasons why i was you know attracted to to what you guys are doing um so just continue continue to be yourself <laughs> because when you try to be like everybody else is it's 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 boring these days to be honest to be yeah. honest yeah absolutely man. well thank yeah. you so much for for that for that um that praise i really appreciate it yeah and you know thank you so much for giving up the time to talk today um you know it's, it's been a huge pleasure for me um mm-hmm. and um you've got you've got this uh, sort of holiday period coming up so wish you and your family all the best for the the festive period and mm-hmm. very best of luck for the rest of the season yeah no i appreciate it man uh so thanks for having me and also merry christmas and happy new year to you to you guys Thank you, man. That was Awert Mabil on the Nordic Football Podcast. Thank you very much for your time. And a great interview there from Henry, who you can follow on Twitter at FootballInDK. I'll put it in the link below uh, on the uh, YouTube uh, video description. But well worth a follow. You can also follow uh, Awer on Twitter if you want, at AwerMabil17 on Twitter and he's also on Instagram uh, awamabil10 on Instagram there if you want to give him a follow there uh, of course you can follow the Nordic Football Podcast at Nordic Foot Pod for uh, the latest uh, from from us uh, myself at Meatman Soccer and of course our other uh, my usual co-host Jonathan for Dugba at JF Football but uh, until next time which will be the end of season reviews uh, I'll say goodbye Take care, stay safe everyone, and we'll see you around.